lot of uh, 2003 talk. Game played in 2003. We're weeding through that again. All right. There it is. There it is. <laughs> You look at well, Miami's current roster, and you know most of them were still in diapers or or prior to that, before, when Miami was relevant. Uh, I know that they have a big game coming up against Clemson this weekend. I am a big Derek King fan. I I, I think it's it, they're ex, an exciting team to watch, but Clemson knows how to win these types of games. Miami hasn't won one of these games in forever in a day. And I think when Miami gets punched in the mouth the first time, and it's going to happen repeatedly, especially if it's a wet track, uh, I think that Clemson is going to run away with this game. Mm -hmm. it's not even going to be close, 24, 28 points minimum. The the comment below, confidence has been a lacking trait in Miami for years. This season is different. I would argue the opposite. opposite. Confidence has been way too high for years at Miami for no reason at all, and that has been uh, a poor You, trait. baby, it's the you. And when when you are confident for no reason, and uh, it's uh, like building a house on sand, basically, and that's what Miami has been for many many years. Maybe they have a foundation now. Who knows? We'll see. I do find it ironic, Kevin, that uh, bad weather would uh, sidetrack the Hurricanes. Yeah, I was going to say that I think they have the right head coach. I think that they're a program on the rise, but they're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. Uh, beating up on on Florida State who's going to get boat raced by uh, Notre Dame and whoever you know else they played at this point uh, Louisville who was a fraudulent top 25 team just because other conferences weren't in the picture I just I don't see this I think I think Miami will give them a good quarter but uh, Clemson will, will you know the class will rise to the top and and, and and Clemson has been has been far and away the best ACC team for at least a decade at this point and this game does not I have a feeling I'll be going over and looking for other games uh, at the same time because I, this game won't hold my attention. I think Dear King is he's somewhat legitimate. I think at quarterback for Miami. I mean he he they, they've put some points on the board. It's whether or not they can contain Clemson is probably the biggest question. Clemson gave up twenty three points last week to Virginia, so I don't think their defense is quite where it was a year ago. Um, you know, I think some of those NFL losses are finally starting to come home to roost for them, just as they probably will for Ohio State and somewhat even Alabama hasn't looked perfect so far this year, but uh, they've been pretty good. So, yeah, maybe, you know, this is a year where a Florida, for instance, I've been very impressed what I've seen out of Florida so far with Trask at quarterback that maybe they sneak in there instead of, of somebody. But um, I guess let's play this game on Saturday night and uh, see if Clemson, this year's edition of Clemson is for real, or if Miami is close to being back. Uh, a lot of people skeptical about that, but uh, I do like King and we'll, we'll see. Maybe it gets to be a shootout and uh, a funny bounce goes one way or the other and, and Miami somehow is there at the end, but uh, they're a 14 point underdog and that kind of caught my eye because First of all, Clemson hasn't been that dominant. Secondly, Miami, except for who they played, Louisville and Florida State, they have been that dominant. So um, I don't know. I guess we'll have to see when they shake it up and see what comes out. Miami went 10-0 and in uh, 2017, but it really had no big wins. I think that there was a Notre Dame win in there or something. But uh, we haven't really experienced uh, a Miami fan base during the social media era where they could secure a win like this. I don't know if America is ready. I don't know if the internet is ready. Uh, I certainly know I am not ready for what this could mean if Miami were to win and uh, what the fan reaction would be like. Uh, I, I Fortunately, I don't think it's a realistic uh, concern, uh, so I won't get too worked up about it this weekend. And um, if it happens... There's always a couple weeks down the road when they lose to Pittsburgh. They I know my, my Phil Steele. They, let me, they don't need to have a good team for this because they keep trying to overturn the 2002 Fiesta Bowl. The, I, mean, you know, I mean, that game was forever and a day ago. They keep going. It, it was defensive. It was pass interference. Held them in the end zone. Get over it. Get over it. I, 
And I feel to you whether has the results of that 2017 down there. Just but get over it. You lost. My my Phil Steele has the results of that 2017 season. Uh, they lost to Pittsburgh, who I don't think was very good. They were uh, 11 and a half point favorite and lost the game 24 to 14. And then the last time they played Clemson was in the ACC championship game that year, and they lost 38 to three uh, as like a 10 and one or 11 and one team. They lost 38 to three to Clemson. So, are we in for something like that tomorrow? And I think King keeps them in the game, but. Uh, you know, what, nothing would surprise me, I guess. That team had a 14-3 lead in the Orange Bowl against Wisconsin and lost by 10. <laughs> yeah. Wisconsin seems to play them every year in the postseason and beats them. So, yeah. Three times in the last roughly 10 years. Yeah. That's not a good matchup for Miami, which is, uh, I would say, maybe a superficial kind of program at times. And Wisconsin is Wisconsin's superficiality. Too and Wisconsin Stop is very toughness. not superficial. Too much Wisconsin. Yes. Blocking and tackling, <laughs> posing for the cameras. Blocking and tackling. Whoa. Here we go. Wearing a turnover I'm chain. Gonna, I'm going to have to bear the brunt of all this. You guys realize <laughs> that, right? We've missed you. <laughs> <laughs> so I pointed out. This was about six months ago after the last season in which I actually thought I overrated Miami, and it turned out that I did at eight and four, and they went six and seven. The previous year, nine and three, when they went seven and six. I had to point that out a number of times a few nights ago as I was called a Miami hater for simply pointing to the video in which I outlined that over the last 15 years, it's been a 57% winning percentage program. So they have recruited top 15 to 20 talent, not elite talent across the board, but top 15 to 20 talent. And they've turned that top 15 talent into top 40 teams. And that's what they've been. And there have been, I think I mentioned this a couple months ago right here, 43 teams that have finished in the AP top 10 since Miami last did. 43, that's eight teams plus per Power 5 conference. It's pretty staggering. And as Tony pointed out, this is going to be a huge game for Miami. This is run of the mill for Clemson, and that's all there is to it. There's nothing wrong with Miami fans and wanting to to, to um, think that this is the team, and it may very well be uh, a better team than uh, most think and may knock off Clemson uh, because they have finally gotten a quarterback with dynamic playmaking ability who seems to be making the right decisions, and he's such a huge upgrade over what they've had the last 10 or 15 years. But uh, they've played UAB, Louisville, and Florida State, and they've done against those teams what you would expect a top 10 team to do, but now they're truly playing a top three to four team in the country. Should you go, go from coaches like Jimmy Johnson, Dennis Erickson, and Butch Davis to Larry Coker, Randy Shannon, Manny Moe, and Jack, and some homeless bum off of the corner of, uh, of A1A and, and – ABL. And, I mean, ABL was the coach there for a while, and uh, so was Mark Rick for about a cup of coffee. I, 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 they're always going to be able to have talent, but it's so much about development and they've just not, they've just made ridiculously bad head coaching hires. And they, I think they really thought that they stole one when they brought in Mark Rick and Mark Rick was, I mean, was, was a shell of, of the Mark Rick that we saw at UGA. And I think that Manny Diaz is, is the right guy. Um, we'll see, we'll see how long he lasts. Uh, but, uh, you know, they went from having some of, you know, some of the biggest names in coaching to, you know, guys that I don't really even remember the, remember the name of, I mean, I, when the name that jumps off the page, the most of me is Al Golden, uh, you know, yeah. maybe Al Bundy. Yeah. That's the guy I was referring to as JBL, the wrestler. They I think they were separated at birth. I would like to ask people that reference that game to not only watch the play uh, that uh, resulted in, of course, a converted first down on the pass interference, just go back and watch the last five minutes of the game. Just try to remove whatever colors from your fandom, whichever side, just watch the last five minutes of the game or watch the entire game again. But watch the last five minutes and see if you see any other calls that could have reversed fortunes for an offense staying on the field and maybe running out the clock. Remove your colors, remove your fake turnover chains, 
and just watch the game and see uh, see Dustin Fox getting his jersey ripped off and see Chris Gamble catching a pass on third and 14 that gets uh, ruled an incompletion. And then, um, you know, but, you know, we, we could also talk about uh, Clemson, you know, bad calls in the Clemson game if we want to <laughs> start complaining about bad refs or refs in, in particular. But, yeah, that Miami game, uh, I, I I wonder why Miami fans – can't be can't just watch it and understand it and see it because there's there's plenty of video proof there's uh, why they can't get over it. i guess because maybe they can't get over it because it is true what i always say and that's jim trestle broke miami and if they could just as reverse time and make it like that never happened then maybe they won't be broken but you can't get that game back. You can't get the last two decades back. You can't fix it all in one day. And maybe that's another reason why the U is the issue has the issues it does is because they think they're the U, so it can just be there's nothing to fix. You just go and play. And whenever somebody transfers to Miami, that's the last time I'm ever going to see them because I know pretty much their career is over. Now, maybe that's not – we're seeing some uh, – Jalen Phillips is, is doing well. Uh, at Miami, but when people, what's that? When he's not ejected from game, well, but like when when somebody chooses Miami, it's just like okay, I see you. You're not interested in football. You're interested in the idea of Miami, and I think when you're not interested in football, it's really hard to build a football culture. And I don't think they have a football culture. I think they have a Hurricanes culture, and I don't think that's winning. And I don't think. All of the all of that talent back in the early '90s and mid '90s, they were playing against offenses and defenses that were all very basic. There is no more basic anymore. You know, I would like to see what um, you know what they could have done against what we consider modern things now, and would they still hold up? And would things be so much? Would it be as easy to stop for all of those guys? Sure, Ed Reed would still be great. Um, There'd, there'd still be plenty of talent, but would they have um, would they have just been not necessarily a dynasty lesser than maybe Alabama? Would they be lesser than a Clemson? You know, I, I don't think they would have been um, the end all be all. I don't think they'd be worthy of two 30 for 30 documentaries. Not that they were uh, worthy of that anyway. It wouldn't translate well into today into today's game because with targeting and if you breathe on the quarterback or something, I mean that's not good. I don't think that they're. It, it was it was it was a different era. I don't think that that those teams back then would translate well. There's a there's a need for discipline now that maybe there wasn't back that there wasn't back then, and uh, you don't want to give offenses too many too many opportunities for you know, a late hit or roughing the punter and stuff like that, because that will come back to haunt you. Well, there's a few different reasons why that, um, that loss has stung and it has reverberated and continued one being exactly what you said. They haven't bounced back from it. So had they stayed an elite team and continue to win championships and stay in contention, then it would be, well, we should have won that game, but it would have been lost. Plus, the sting of losing a championship is one thing, but the sting of losing a championship when you already assumed it was a win, that's that's tough to take. But Ohio State is over the 2006 game uh, against Florida. You know, the, uh, everybody thought they were going to win that one, but Miami, you're right. There's a confidence level there that no, no other people can match. I think what it, it reminds me of is like Miami has become what, happened to uncle Rico from Napoleon dynamite. If the coach had just put him in that championship game, they would have won. And because he didn't get to be put into that game, he now lives in a, in a van out in the field all by himself and just, just has driven himself crazy thinking about if the coach just would have put him in, he would have been all state. And if Ohio state wouldn't have beaten Miami, Miami would have been all state and they could throw a football over the mountains. Back to my Al Bundy. He once scored five touchdowns against Polk High. <laughs> well, I'm sure they're going to handle the heat loss tonight really well, too. So, 
We talk Ohio State football here each and every week. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Unless Miami comes out. I just, did, I just did an hour before this hour. I'm, 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 my head's spinning right now. Next week, we'll talk Michigan. We'll go for an hour. Oh, Lord. The Miami invasion is here, and the Miami invasion comes to all my shows, which, which is a great thing. I appreciate yeah. the Miami fan base that I have. I just um, simply tell the truth and uh, do my very best to stay neutral and tell the truth. And uh, the facts, sometimes um, it, it is a, uh, a dynasty of sorts, a legacy unlike anything in college football. Uh, I've got a contributor that comes on, Cam Underwood, that calls it the microwave dynasty, and that's exactly what it was. It was an early 80s through mid-90s dynasty, and then a couple of years tacked on around 2000, 2001, and two, And that's the history of the program. Was the Nebraska dynasty better? Because I remember like in college where there was just no hope of Nebraska losing like for like two or three years straight. Like, and then when Arizona state did it, you're like, Whoa, this sort of thing is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, I don't know which one would be better. Although that I guess then they played on the field and decided it. Yeah. When Nebraska finally beat Miami in the 94-95 Orange Bowl, that was a shock to many because Miami just trounced them every time they got on the field. And then Nebraska figured out that they could keep their style of offense but just add some speed and uh, figure that out. And there's actually a good documentary on the Big Ten Network about that Nebraska team that, uh, <laughs> that pulled through and finally beat Miami, and they changed their philosophy. They, they were able to, and this is difficult to do, was to add to their previous philosophy, not discard the Nebraska way and the weightlifting and the, the bulk and the power game, but just add to it. And it was very successful with three championships in four years. <laughs> 